So when I was uh, 17 years old, turning 18, um, I had gotten accepted into college. And in college was the first time I got exposed to like very large groups of Muslims. We had like a small MSA at our high school, but this was at a, at a different level. What was really interesting about our MSA, and keep in mind this is over 20 years ago now, was it was very male dominant and it was very Dean centric. So what I mean by that is that there was a very strict code of ethics that if a brother saw you speaking to a non-mahram woman, he would call you out on it. And they had this system of like a black flag and a red flag that if you get caught talking, it's a black flag. But if you get caught, you know, doing something uh, above and beyond that, it's a red flag. And there was like literally a system that people used to keep track of uh, on all the brothers. The positive that came out of that was that there was this positive reinforcement to stay as halal as possible. The negative that came out of that is the deep level of trauma that it, it built in you that any time a non mahram woman came to ask you about a class or a homework or an assignment or anything like that, you're always paranoid, hey, is someone watching me? Am I gonna get flagged right now? Which leads me to a follow-up story. Now I've been accepted into the Islamic University of Medina. I came back, I can't remember if it was my first summer or my second summer, but we had just finished playing basketball late at night after Isha, and it's maybe about like 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and we're at a local convenience store, just uh, you know, buying like Gatorade and stuff like that. And then one of the girls that I went to, to college with, she shows up and she's like, the date I haven't seen in a long time. And I don't know if she was like going through like a rough time or if she was intoxicated, but she comes running towards me trying to, to hug me. And, you know, I was like, no, I have all my college friends here. I'm not getting reflected now. And that's what's going through my head. I moved out of the way and she ran straight into like the, the candy aisle and the thing tumbled over. And I felt so bad. Wallahi, I felt so bad that when I think bad, think back about it, I'm like, smile, I shouldn't have done that. Or I should have stuck around because as soon as that happened, I jet from the store. <laughs> I completely left and I felt bad about that. And when I think back about this, I think it's about... And this topic here today on establishing a balance and a proper understanding as to what Islam allows and what Islam doesn't allow and how do you deal with these sorts of situations moving forward. So now that you know my story, we can jump straight into it. The way I want to present my presentation today is by establishing some basic guidelines and principles that are agreed upon and then we're going to look at specific examples and how do you actually navigate through those examples. So the first principle we want to establish is that matters of this dunya are halal and permitted until proven otherwise. So what that means is that when it comes to things related to ibadah, you need a specific evidence to show that it is allowed before you're allowed to do that act of ibadah. Whereas when it comes to interactions with people and anything related to the dunya, it's the exact opposite that those matters are allowed until proven to be haram. So you need a specific evidence that doing that thing is haram and only then would it become haram. So something simple like drinking water. Do I need to prove that drinking water is halal or do I need to prove that drinking water is haram? So if I took the position that drinking water is haram, the onus would be on me. The onus of proving the harim, of proving something is haram would be upon that person. Because it goes against the asr, it goes against the foundational principle that it is permitted until proven otherwise. Number two, we have a principle in Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah. These are uh, legal maxims in Islam that if you were to analyze all of fiqh and take out the five biggest principles or the five main reoccurring principles, these are known as Al-Qawaid al-Fiqhiyah al-Kubra. And one of those major legal maxims that all of fiqh revolves around is Al-Ada Muhakkama that the norms and the customs of a people take precedence. Now there's two things to understand that I wanna explain under this principle. Number one is that we as Muslims have our own guiding principles and our own culture. So the way that we speak to another, when we walk into a room, our custom is to say, Assalamu Alaikum. We are allowed to say hi, hello, and good morning, but there's a better greeting that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has given us. So amongst ourselves, that is what we should begin with. That's what I'm referring to. So the way, the, the culture that we have amongst ourselves needs to take precedence. So yes, there's a culture that we will have amongst ourselves, but then there's also a culture that we are allowed to be a part of when we're amongst our non-Muslim colleagues. And this is where I want to explain something that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says. So Ibn Taymiyyah was a humbly jurist. He was a great scholar of Islam, very renowned, but he was also known for his orthodoxy and conservatism. And that's why I like to highlight what he says. 
So he has a book known as Iqtada uh, Sarat al Mustaqim, following the, 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 the straight path in summary. And in this, he talks about those instances and situations of Muslims living in non Muslim lands and what is actually allowed for them. And he mentions how for believing uh, men, for believers in general, they are allowed to embrace al hadi al zahir the physical open appearance of non-Muslims. And sometimes it would be recommended mustahab and sometimes it would be wajib. So this is the exact language that he's using. Under what circumstances? If it is to attain a good, a maslaha saliha, or to prevent an evil or to prevent a harm from taking place. So this shows us that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says that even amongst non-Muslims, it can be recommended or it can be obligatory to embrace their physical outwardly interactions for the sake of maximizing a benefit or for minimizing a harm. So both of those principles need to be understood correctly that yes, we do embrace the norms of a society and its customs while amongst ourselves, we have our own customs and culture while not um, sacrificing our ethics and those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly made prohibited in embracing the customs of the non-Muslim society. Number three, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about gender interaction. So there's two specific verses I want to highlight. The first of them is in Surah Al-Isra where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Wala zina, that do not come close to zina. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes this approach in teaching us about zina that you shouldn't come close. It's not about don't do it, but don't come close to it. So it's a very precautionary, preemptive approach that do not do anything that will even bring you close to it. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces us to gender interaction, that when we think about gender interaction, anything that will lead to zina, you want to stay away from. And this in Usul al-Fiqh is known as Saddu al staying away from those things or preventative measures that are put into place that can lead to something haram. The second verse I want to speak about is in Surah An-Nur, verses 30 and 31, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believing men and the believing women to lower from their gaze towards the opposite gender that you shouldn't be staring at them. And we all know the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the first look is for yourself and the second look is from shaitan, meaning that you have to stay away from it and you should not pursue that second look. So we want to understand that the approach that Islam takes to gender interaction is that while it recognizes it is a necessity, it also preemptively wants to prohibit those things that will lead to illicit haram relationships. It also wants to prohibit those things that will lead to illicit haram relationships. So now, when you look at this understanding of it, things will make a lot more sense. Things will make a lot more sense. And I want to quickly touch back on something we had in the Q&A last night when Sheikh Walid was talking about the importance of showing up with a pure heart on the Day of Judgment. When he was talking about prolonged feelings of desire and how even those prolonged feelings of desire, even though they may not have an action related to it, become haram because they start corrupting the heart. Because they start corrupting the heart. So what I want to highlight at this point over here is that yes, at certain points, certain things may become permissible or even overlooked. The Sharia is willing to overlook them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. But that does not mean that you keep looking for the exceptions to the rule. That does not mean that you're always looking for a way out because at a certain point in time, it will start to impact your heart and you want to make sure that your heart is always pure. So the spiritual barrier with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited is what is of the utmost importance. And that is why I think when we think about physical barriers in our masajid, physical barriers in our conferences, they do serve a benefit but up and until people have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn to develop those spiritual barriers in their hearts between that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited and themselves, those physical barriers will do little to no good. So in terms of priorities and in terms of our focus, that spiritual barrier between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited is more important in terms of stepping stones instead of the physical barrier that oftentimes we like to focus on in our masajid. So it is with that introduction that I want to get into specific examples. So the first of them is the issue of shaking hands, right? If you go back to this introduction that I've given, let's talk about Muslim culture. Within Muslim culture, we do not have a custom of shaking hands with the opposite gender. 
if they are not mahram to us. So your sisters, your aunts, your mothers, by all means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to shake hands with them. Your mother-in-law, your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to shake hands with them. And that can be considered a part of our culture. But with regards to non-mahrams, it's not a part of Muslim culture to hug or to, to kiss on the cheek or to shake hands. And that is something that we cannot embrace. And what's become very, very unfortunate is that as you look at mass representation of Muslims in media, you can think about shows on Hulu, think about a recent show that just came out on Netflix. We get very, very happy that there's Arab and Muslim representation that, you know, the plight of the Palestinians, mashallah, is being highlighted. But at the same time, what is happening to the Muslim characters in these shows? Why is it that they're so comfortable committing zina, whether with other Muslim characters or non-Muslim characters? Why are we normalizing the haram and making it seem as if it's okay? I understand it's a part of our society. I understand that Muslims will be committing it. We heard Sheikh Shanawi's statistic, 78% of high school students, you know, have done one of the four things, uh, two of the four things between alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, um, and smoking, right? So that's the reality on the ground, but it doesn't mean we normalize it and make it acceptable. If it's done, we should feel shame and we should hide it and make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So within Muslim culture, the shaking of hands should not take place, the hugging should not take place, taking pictures with one another, with arms around one another should not be taking place. And just because we have Muslims in pop culture that are doing it, it doesn't mean that it's okay. At the end of the day, if you remember what I was talking about yesterday in terms of our ultimate authority and criterion in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the Quran, his speech, and the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is in terms of shaking hands with one another and physical contact with one another. Now, how about with non-Muslims? How about with non-Muslims? How does that work exactly? Well, firstly, we establish the principle that things are halal until proven haram. We establish the custom that they take precedence as long as it doesn't go against anything specifically haram. And we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited those things that will lead to zina and also commands us to lower our gaze towards the opposite gender, specifically when we feel desire towards them. Now let's build upon this. In a tabarani the Prophet Sallallahu says that it is better for a man to be stabbed in the head with an iron rod than for him to touch a woman that is non-mahram to him. Than for him to touch a woman that is non-mahram to him. What do you notice about this hadith? A couple of things. Number one, that it's reported in At-Tabarani. It's not reported in the major collections. That's something that we will explore. Number two is the graphic detail inside of this hadith that the Prophet Wasallam is giving a very severe and staunch warning. That if you care about your deen, if you care about your akhirah, you're going to stay away from this as much as possible. You're going to stay away from this as much as possible. And that is why we cannot allow this to become a norm and a custom within the Muslim community. Now with regards to non-Muslims, how do we understand this hadith? How do we understand this hadith? So as I was mentioning, this report, hadith is reported in Al-Tabarani, and that is an indication that the other collectors of hadith, like Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, and Nasai, Ibn Majah, they didn't pick it up. And there's something interesting to look at, that if you look at the discussion of the early hadith scholars, for those of you that you know are, are hadith specialists, the likes of Ibn Abi Hatim and uh, Ali ibn al-Madini and others, they've weakened the hadith. They've said that this hadith is, is not authentic for various reasons. But then you have contemporary scholars, the likes of Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'a, one of the leading hadith scholars of our times. He said that the hadith is authentic. So I wanted to point out that difference of opinion on the authenticity of the hadith. A second thing I wanted to point out is that this term of touching, when it's mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah with regards to the opposite gender, it's actually a polite way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to marital intimacy, of referring to marital intimacy. And you find this in the Quran as well, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about lam sun nisa. Over there it's referring to marital intimacy and it's not referring to the actual physical touch itself. Now why is this important to highlight? This is important to highlight to understand the scope of our discussion, the scope of our discussion. So now let's further break this down into our interaction with our non-Muslim colleagues. There are those that we're going to work with frequently and there are those that literally you'll have one meeting with them in your life and you'll move on or it's non-frequent at all. The ones that we work with frequently, perhaps they're on the same team, perhaps we're in the same classroom, whatever it may be. 
It is with those individuals that you need to communicate specific guidelines. Things like, look, I know we're going to be working very closely together, but these are my boundaries. These are boundaries that I will not exceed. Alhamdulillah, we live in a day and age where the term boundaries is actually very, very acceptable. And as Muslims, we should embrace that for our benefit. So when we talk about boundaries, we're not going to be spending any time alone together. If we ever have to be in a room together, we're going to leave the door open. We're not going to close that door. If it's something confidential, let's try to have a third party that's there so that we're not by ourselves. When it comes to physical contact, please understand that I mean this with the utmost love and respect, but I would prefer if we didn't shake hands or we didn't embrace, because that would make me feel more comfortable. And that sort of language is very acceptable. And I know a lot of times Muslims are hesitant to bring up the issue of religion, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to specifically actively give da'wah at all times that my religion makes it haram, and that's why I won't be having any physical contact with you. It's perfectly fine just to say that this is the boundary, this is my personal boundary, and I hope that you can respect it. And this is what you need to do with those non-Muslim colleagues that you're developing a long-term working relationship with, so they understand that both of you can be comfortable and both of you can thrive in your workspace. Rather than each and every day you having to worry that when I show up at work, is so-and-so going to try to hug me? Is so-and-so going to try to shake my hand? Is so-and-so going to pat me on the back? You're constantly in this state of worry, but if you cut it off from the root and you have this difficult conversation in the beginning, it will save you months, if not years, of anxiety and hardship of always having to go through it. And if, it, if you embraced it, then leaving, living with that guilt, you know, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala view me right now, right? So that conversation, as difficult as it may be, be preemptive about it from the very get-go that you know you're going to be working in a long-term relationship with this person. Have this discussion to avoid that awkwardness and that guilt moving forward. Now, how about those situations where you're working with a colleague that, like I said, you're not going to see them ever again in your life or literally it's very, very infrequent. How about in those situations? In those sort of situations, number one, never put your hand out yourself. This is what I always tell Muslims, that never put your hand out at the, your, yourself. And sometimes you will see that may, they may not even initiate a handshake with you. They may not even initiate a handshake with you. Number two is that one of the positive things that COVID did was that people were no longer shaking hands. And that was good. It made things less awkward for Muslims. Now, under the circumstance, let's just say you're just arriving at a meeting, someone from the opposite gender sticks out their hand, and you don't have the time to explain, you don't have the time to react, and in fact, it's just your natural reaction, someone sticks their hand out, you shake their hand at that time. It is hoped that at that time, because you didn't intend it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will overlook it, because you did not intend it. Does that mean that you actively put out your hand and try to shake hands with the opposite gender? No, not at all. What we're saying is that in those circumstances where it is beyond your ability to prevent it, and in those circumstances where you're trying to save face and save yourselves from embarrassment, which the Sharia would recognize as a harm, then in those sort of situations, it is hoped that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would overlook it. So it is this holistic approach to, to, to touching and handshaking that I, I think we can appreciate and understand the pragmatism and practicality of our faith. Which leads us to the second topic that I wanted to discuss, which is the issue of khalwa, of being alone with the opposite gender. And this gets a lot more complicated in our times because we have the dynamics of the online space, we have the dynamics of our mobile phones, we have the dynamics of being in an Uber or in a taxi, and then we have the dynamics of a mixed workspace as well. So all of this being understood, again, I want to highlight the importance of that spiritual barrier between you and that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. So living a life of taqwa as much as is possible. Recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything that we say and he sees everything that we do. But more importantly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that we feel and that which we intend. And certain times, yes, you may not cross the boundary of physical touch. Certain times, you may not cross the boundary of flirting with the opposite gender. Certain times, you may not cross the boundary of doing something physically haram. But if you let that feeling of desire linger in your heart long enough, where you now become preoccupied with that person in your thoughts, you're dreaming about them in your dreams, in your free moments, you're just thinking about them, even though you may not have done physically something haram, you've already allowed for your heart to become corrupt. 
or corrupted or leading towards corruption, depending on how far it's gotten. And that is something that we can't allow to happen. So keep all of that in mind as we talk about these incidents of what isolation looks like. The Prophet Sallallahu specifically says that no man should be alone with a woman except that she is with one of our maharam, someone that is mahram, that is a third party in this. And the Prophet Sallallahu says specifically that no two people are alone together, meaning one man and one woman, except that shaitan is the third. Except that shaitan is the third. So understand that shaitan is going to leverage that as much as possible that even though you may be married, shaitan is going to start planting the doubts. But this person is better looking, more handsome, more prettier. This person does this and does better. This person looks so it's and such better. And X, Y, and Z. Shaitan knows how to manipulate our emotions and manipulate our thoughts to get us preoccupied with those things. So that spiritual barrier is so important and I can't emphasize that enough. So now with that being said, what is the actual boundary in terms of what is halal and haram in those situations? So with regards to physical isolation, you are allowed to be alone in a room as long as people have public access to coming in and out or hearing or seeing what is going on. That is something that would be allowed. So there's a boardroom in your workspace. You're working in there. Another colleague comes in. As long as the door is open, it would be halal for you to be there. Now, just because something is halal, does that mean that, that is what we should pursue? Not necessarily. At that time, if you have another workspace that you can go to, that is the better thing to do. But if there's no other workspace available, then know that it is permitted for you to do that. Similarly, when it comes to taxis and Uber rides, you can't really control who your driver is going to be. And SubhanAllah, I got the, like the shock of my life in February of 2020. It was um, my first time back in Riyadh, or actually in Saudi Arabia, since women were allowed to drive. And I ordered an Uber, and it doesn't tell you who your Uber driver is over there. And I get into the Uber, and it's actually a female driver. And I, I like, literally, I, 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 I thought it was like in the twilight zone. Because having lived in Medina for so long, being non custom to female drivers, like I'm like, what is happening over here? Is this a reality? And then on top of that, it's uh, she wasn't wearing niqab, and she was a dentist student, and I, I couldn't understand and fathom what was happening. So the, the point being over here, if that's like in a place like Saudi Arabia now, you can imagine even more so anywhere else that you're going to be, there are going to be those situations. So how do you prevent awkwardness while still preserving your deen at that time? Mitigate the conversation as much as possible. Be polite, they ask how you're doing, respond politely and be courteous at that time. But don't over-exaggerate the conversation. You don't need to get into each other's personal lives. They don't need to know where you're going or what you're doing in the city. Be polite and to the point and minimize it as much as possible. If you're able to keep the windows open, that's probably the best thing to do. And just focus on your work at that time. And that is why when I get into Ubers, one of the best things I like to do is just have my headphones ready. Even though I may not be listening to anything, it's a polite way of saying, look, I'm not really interested in conversation. Because oftentimes it's true, you have other work to do, right? You gotta focus on something. So that is what I would recommend, just carry those headphones with you, keep them in your ear, and just continue doing your work. But be polite and courteous, try to keep the windows open if you can, and mitigate the conversation as much as possible when it is with the opposite gender. And that Uber ride or that taxi ride would be halal for you as a part of you taking these precautionary measures. Now, how about if we take this other approach of, you know what, it's easy to cancel an Uber. Well, Ubers catch you onto that, by the way. I don't know how many of you tried to cancel an Uber recently, but after it's confirmed, they actually start penalizing you now if you cancel an Uber a certain amount of money. And you can't frequently cancel anymore. And other times you are in circumstances where you need to arrive somewhere on time and it's just not feasible according to your time. So yes, the approach of taqwa is better if you're able to do so and you know that you're going to be in that situation. But if you're not able to do so, then take these precautionary measures as well. Let's talk about the online space. In the pandemic, things like Zoom and Teams and Google Hangouts have been, you know, a common space. Even FaceTime uh, through Apple pre-pandemic has become a common space. I would actually suggest that when you're dealing with the opposite gender alone, you try not to use those. Right? If you have to make a phone call, just use a normal phone call. If you have to use, let's just say you're traveling overseas and you have to speak to one of your work colleagues, do audio only. What is the need for the video? Leave the video for those necessities. Leave the videos for the presentations that you need to do. And if there's no need for a video, don't go into it. Right? 
And again, these are boundaries that you establish with your work colleagues. You want to create an atmosphere where you're going to thrive, and you let them know what your comfort levels are, and people will respect that. People will respect that. Now, particularly for, for those of us that are in university, in high school, it's very common you'll exchange phone numbers with your classmates. You're going to add each other on Snapchat. You're going to add each other on Instagram, WhatsApp, whatever these things. These are the boundaries you need to establish for yourselves. Adding someone on Instagram within of itself is not haram. Adding someone on Instagram, on Snapchat is not haram. But I want you to ask yourself this question, where do I see this going? And why am I doing it? Sometimes we just follow customs and embrace the norms of a society without thinking of the long-term ramifications. If you look at the essence of Snapchat, one of the fundamental principles of Snapchat is do whatever you want and leave no trace behind. That is why pictures get deleted right away, videos get deleted right away, and that was the fundamental premise that you can't get caught. So you want to think about why are we using these social media platforms and adding people of the opposite gender, where do we see it going? And oftentimes, if you ask yourself this fundamental question, you'll come to the conclusion that you know what? It's not right for me to do that because I don't see this going anywhere positive. I don't see this going anywhere positive. You know, there was a time where people may delude themselves. I'm going to give this person that one. They're going to accept Islam. How many people ended up accepting Islam through our conversations on Snapchat and Instagram? The reality is it doesn't happen that way. And you delude yourself with these pious and noble intentions. So when it comes to the online space, yes, it may not be haram, but the approach of taqwa is always better. The approach of taqwa is always better. You need to communicate for school or for work or whatever the circumstance is. Use the platform that will mitigate the development of feelings as much as possible. Oftentimes when you think of what is the harm in sending a text message? What is the harm in sending an email? We realize that within of itself, a text message and email may not lead to illicit feelings, but the reality is that it's not just about the email. It's not just about the text message. It's about your day-to-day -day interaction with this person that is transcending into a physical relationship into an external relationship when you're at home or in a space outside of work and school. And that's what you want to cut off because that is where things will get out of hand. If you keep that relationship at work and keep that separate from your personal life, then that is where you can keep things as halal as possible. So again, this is what I wanted to, to emphasize that particularly with the handshaking and the physical contact, as well as this issue of isolation, those are the two biggest issues we want to look at these are the guidelines to keep in mind, always keeping that spiritual barrier between you and the haram there. Now the concluding remarks that I want to, to share with you before I invite Sheikh Ammar up is let's talk about a phenomenon on social media where in this day and age, everyone wants to become an influencer and everyone wants to get rich by you know, promoting uh, businesses online and having quote unquote influence. Within of itself, I don't think that's a bad thing. People should pursue avenues of income as much as they can. What we do want to be careful of are the sins that we may be committing without even realizing that they are sins. So specifically for those brothers that are working out and that are athletes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded an aura that needs to be covered at all times, from the navel to the knee. And even beyond that, modesty is encouraged for men just like it is for women. So you don't need to show off your body. You don't need to show off, hey, it's leg day today. Let me show off my quads and my thighs. Dude, no one cares, right? At the end of the day, you have to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, look at your intentions. What are you doing this for? Are you trying to get recognition from your colleagues or trying to get recognition from the opposite gender? Why are you doing this? What is the goal behind this? Even for the sisters, and this is a much more difficult conversation to have, but it is a conversation that needs to be had. And I'm hoping that one day, inshallah, we can have a sister have this conversation with the sisters. But for those sisters that aren't wearing hijab, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you. But that does not give you free license that just because you are struggling with the hijab in real life, that you start posting pictures of yourself online and make it publicly accessible. If you want to keep your Instagram and social media accounts publicly accessible, then you want to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a compromised position, in a compromised position where non-mahram men will have access to it. Lock it and restrict it only for women and particularly for those women that you know. 
And if you want to become an influencer, become an influencer from amongst the women itself. And don't be a public influencer in that space because it is feared. And I, I say this out of a place of love and genuine concern for you, that I wouldn't want you to show up on the day of judgment and you see all of this sin of something that you were not cognizant of. That non-mahram men looking at you where you're trying to beautify yourself and present yourself to the world for the sake of uh, you know, earning a few dollars. It's not a position that we want to put ourselves in. Hijab in of itself is a struggle, but it doesn't come with a free license to commit haram. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. And that outlet is there that lock your profile and make it accessible only to women. And I want to present the other side of it as well. I also think that we as a community sometimes are too harsh and too strict on those sisters that are observing hijab and our influencers as well. And I believe that space is a very, very important influ uh, space for two reasons. Number one, for positive female role models, there definitely aren't enough of them. And then number two, those sisters are actually creating good quality content. And that content from a woman's perspective is so important in this day and age. Particularly when we have this whole, you know, fraction of the red pill coming up and rising again and on the borderline of misogyny and stuff, that those voices and that content is very, very important. So the Muslim community needs to be supportive of those sisters that are observing proper hijab and are creating good quality content and are trying to be good positive role models. And we can't keep disparaging them and putting them down either because we're doing a disservice to our younger sisters that are growing up in the society that do not have access to positive female role models. So that is also part of our responsibility. Those are the concluding remarks I wanted to share with you. And as is usual, I want to leave you with a resource. And this is from your own hometown, Sheikh Hatam Al-Hajj, Hafizullah. He has a fantastic book published by IAPH. It's actually available online called Gender Interaction in Islam. It will give you more detailed evidences and have more detailed discussions on all the topics that I've presented on and much, much more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our communities, forgive our sins, protect us from zina, and protect our youth. Jazakumullah khairan.